directory school board of directors meeting at 6 33. Um, so first order is uh, public comment. Do we have anyone live or virtually who would like to give public comment? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, oh. Yes. If you do, please come up to the front um, and uh, announce yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she is not. Um, all right. I'm Carmen Skinder. And that's Gabe Grofman. And we're some representatives from Earth Group at the high school. Cool. Um, so we came here, as you may remember, last year uh, to discuss the like implementation of a net zero plan for the school district. Um, currently, the uh, city of Montpelier has one, but it excludes the school district. And we're some of the biggest emitters of carbon in the city. And we're just thinking that, especially since we have some extra funds this year, it's like an especially good time to think seriously about implementing that policy. Um, so in the past, we have discussed uh, forming like a committee to come up with a plan to do so, because obviously it's a lot to take on. Um, and we'd be really excited and happy to work with the school board on a way to make that come to fruition. I don't know if Gabe has anything to add. But... I mean, yeah, just that it's like a pretty big opportunity right now to um, to use some of this money to um take a better look at how we heat the school and where energy comes from. Um, and to the point about uh, how this affects students like well being and health, I think uh, climate change and the climate crisis and our environment is a pretty big part of uh, students health and well being and everything like that. Um, and I think that's pretty important and a pretty big part of uh, what Montpelier stands for. So um, hopefully we can use this as an opportunity to move that forward. Excellent. No, thank, thank you very you. much. Um, we are definitely you know, thinking about climate as we invest as our funds and something we're going to talk about more throughout the year. So we really want to be there to look at that. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a super important issue. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Um, anyone else uh, for public comment? Um, so on to the consent agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? Everything except grants resignation because we're not. <laughs> <laughs> I would approve that. Is it possible? Can we just have it? <laughs> Um, I do have a motion to approve, approve the consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda. You have a second. Second. Uh, Joe there. is a tie. I think Joe got it. Uh, um, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <laughs> and Kristen, I'm assuming you voted aye. Um, I did say aye, yes. Thanks. <laughs> uh, so speaking of grants, uh, it's our second budget presentation. Thank you for coming again, and I'll hand it over to you. Great. And um... okay, Grant, I'm sorry. Can you repeat for one second? Did Anna send you today a uh, um, new hire? Yes. No. No. Oh, yes. A new what? Yeah, a new hire. Uh, uh, the word. New hire. A new hire. Yes, she did. She did. Do we yeah. need to say it? I don't. I just want to make sure that that gets passed as well. Uh, let's make sure. Sorry I, to interrupt. I just remember. I did not see if it was on calls. Yep. Hold on. If it was um, two forty six. Okay. It's not listed on the consent agenda, so I move to approve the new hire. I second. <laughs> Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Thank you, Libby. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy about that. Hi. Yeah. 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 All right, Grant. Sorry. No, that's <laughs> fine. So, um, 
you know, the, the first presentation is like 40 pages and it's a lot of detail. The second one is just changes, so it's not very much. That's the good news. The bad news is the next one is a public forum. So we're back to a big one again. So enjoy tonight while you can. Um, I will tell you that the PDF that you were sent with your board materials, there's been a few real small changes. So what you're gonna see on the screen is has a few different bullets than you might have, but nothing significant. And I'll try to call those out. So Anna, thank you for sharing that briefing. If you could go to the next page. So this is just a reminder, the last presentation included all of the bullets that you see. It is posted on the board's webpage. If you get to the school board's webpage under mrpsvt.org and then go to the school board, there's a button that says uh, budget. Click on that and you'll see last time's presentation. It includes all of those details. Next, please. Now the outline for today is, is much more simple. It's just changes to go over what are still unknowns, give you a quick glance at what the budget looks like, and then go into the tax rates and then remind you of the outlook and give you a summary. Next. Next, Anna. Thank you. So the changes, there's quite a few actually. Um, we talked about it last time that, that we just got the dollar yield right before we came in here. That dollar yield is fantastic news from a tax rate perspective. So what I'm doing right now is on this presentation, I used the scenario B recommendation, which is the one that's um, not quite as high. And it's the one that doesn't, does not assume that we're going to use the, that the state will use the full $90 million surplus. Um, so hopefully it's a conservative number and it won't get any worse. Um, it does dramatically drop the tax rates. Um, on the flip side, the common level of appraisal, we talked about that a little bit and the fact that home prices are going through the roof, which means the CLA will drop and tax rates will go up. Um, we were a little concerned that maybe I hadn't dropped that CLA assumption enough. So I dropped it some more and I'm hoping, especially for Montpelier, that, that the additional 4% that I reduced it will be safe. Roxbury is a little bit of a wild card because last year their CLA went up for some unknown reason. And so if there's a correction, they could really drop down. I just don't know. And hopefully we'll know soon. I would say hopefully by the end of the month, maybe 23rd, Merry Christmas. Um, so we'll see that soon. And for the January 5th presentation, that will be plugged in. So that'll be one less thing that's unknown. Also, since the tax rate was coming down a little bit, we talked about the fact that we have five ESSER funded positions and the desire we have to try to make sure that those are sustainable to try to pull those into the local funding. Um, one position already had been done at UES. Uh, we looked at the other positions and we're looking at this community liaison position thinking this is certainly something we wanna hold on to. It looks like it's a permanent thing that we're gonna need. So we shifted that ESSER funded position into local funds. Um, and with those three statements there, you're gonna see later on, and I don't mean to spoil the surprise, but later on, you're gonna see that the tax rates from this year to next year, right now are pretty much level, which would be fantastic. Um, but there are still those unknowns, so I'm a little nervous still, but we'll see. Um, expenses, so we got a statewide pre-K tuition rate, which was a little bit higher than I assumed, so it increased the cost by $2,000. Um, there's a higher tech tuition rate, but that's a, an on behalf payment that we see actually an expense and a revenue. So even though the total expense goes up, the revenues went up too. So it really didn't change the ed spending amount. And then there's higher retirement rates. And what that is, is the Vermont State Teacher Retirement. They have an assessment, two different assessments. One is for any federally funded teacher and so you have to pay a percentage of, of the uh, salary toward this retirement. 
Um, that rate was higher than I thought it would be, but that's also another one where that expense goes up, but the revenue does too, because these are federal funds. So there's no change in ed spending. Unfortunately, the other uh, assessment relates to new teachers uh, and health benefits. So teachers that are new to the retirement program, we have to pay an assessment to make sure that the health benefits are covered. That was a little higher than I assumed as well. So that did increase the budget and ed spending by about 3,000. So not big numbers, thankfully, but um, a little bit. So Anna, next, please. So what is still unknown are the, to me right now, the biggest unknown is equalized pupils. We know our data is gonna be good. Um, so we were hoping that that me might mean that we'll see an increase, but it's always a little bit of a mystery for equalized pupils, right? Because equalized pupils, one of the calculations is an equalizing ratio that gets thrown in at the end. So even though we're looking good at maybe increasing, if somebody else is increasing even more, then they might have to bring everybody down a little bit so that the number of equalized pupils equals the actual number of pupils. So because of that little strange kind of witchcraft that happens, I never really know what's gonna happen with equalized pupils until I see it. And then when we do see it, we typically see three or four versions of it. So we have a long way to go for equalized pupils, but hopefully by the fifth, we'll get at least one or maybe two versions so that we can start getting closer to a real number there. An outside consultancy to clean up our data around this. So our numbers around equalized pupils that we put towards the state are probably the cleanest we've ever had um, because there was a lot of weird snafus in our system based on turnover and of staff and things like that. So we're pretty confident in the numbers that we gave to the state. Right. And they look so, good from our end. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, you look at things like um, free and reduced population, there's a factor that gets thrown in it really increases your numbers and our free and reduced population isn't really that high and others are. So you could see that maybe others might really be expanding their counts, which then at the end, if everybody's brought down, even though we're increasing, we may not be increasing. So that's why I'm a little unsure about that. Um, the dollar yield is still on here because even though we have the tax commissioner recommendation, it has to be set by law. And that doesn't happen until after town meeting day. So that's, that's going to be an unknown all the way through this process. But um, we're using a number that I think is as good as we're probably going to get. And it's a good number. So you'll still see this for probably all the way through, but I don't expect that we're going to actually have a final final until after everything's done. Um, common level of appraisal, we talked a little bit about this. Now you can see I'm assuming a drop of 6.4% in Montpelier and 82 in Roxbury. As I said, I'm pretty confident that that Montpelier assumption is gonna be safe. Um, but Roxbury, just because there's, there's a weird factor in Roxbury that was causing some problems, so much so that even though they were around 100%, which means you shouldn't have to worry about a reappraisal, they are reappraising because there was a problem with their calculation. So I really don't know about that. I'll be relieved when I see that number on the 23rd. Um, and the other unknown is tech center six semester average. Um, that one I do think has a good chance of being higher than what we assumed. And for every kid that is it, that it goes up, it's about $18,000 or so. So if we're off by a few kids, that could be thirty-five dollars to $40,000. So there could be a little bit of an unpleasant surprise for expenses in that area, but we'll, we'll have to see. All right, Anna, please. So at a glance, um, there's, very, there's like two or $3,000 maybe difference from what you had in your original packet. Compared to December 1st, the total budget is going up 4.5% now. If you remember, it was 4.4 before. Um, the ed spending was showing, I think, 3.5 last time, and it's up to 4% now. 
And a big part of that is that position that we shifted from federal funds to local. So even though that didn't increase our expense budget because it was already in there, it reduced our non-tax revenues, which meant our ed spending went up. But once again, we did that because the dollar yield looked good and we thought we could, it would be a good time to put that in and, and get that position sustained. Um, equalized pupils is highlighted obviously because we still don't know. Um, and spending per pupil increase of about 4%. Just so you have a point of reference though, the excess spending threshold this year is 19,977. So we are over $2,000 under the threshold. So we're in great shape for the foreseeable future. Next please, Anna. And actually you can go one more. So the tax rates, the next one, please. There we go. I'm not gonna go through the terminology because we did this last time, but anytime I show the tax rate calculation, I try to keep this chart in there so that people have this for reference. So this just spells out the terms and what they mean. Um, and so if you get asked any questions, you can have some answers. The actual calculation, you saw the top part in that at a glance. What uh, you didn't see was the property dollar yield being thrown in here. And then the um, tax rate. And let's see, the common level of appraisal is still highlighted, but it's 4% it's lower than the last time you saw it. Um, and the important thing that people will look at is the very bottom line, the, uh, residential tax rate with CLA, you can see for Montpelier 1.772 compared to last year, this current year at 1.774. And then Roxbury 1.47 compared to 1.466. So both of those are within a penny. If you round it off, it's, it's not even a penny. So that would be great if this is where we end up. Um, I did call out in those text boxes kind of the impact of some of this so that you kind of get a feel for it. For, for instance, if the property dollar yield hadn't increased, if it was the same, then the tax rate would be 21 to 25 cents higher than it is. That's a huge amount. Um, the merger incentive, having to absorb that loss of two cents of an incentive is about two and a half cents when you factor in the CLA. And then the drop in CLA is huge. If the CLA was level, Montpelier's tax rate would be almost 14 cents lower and Roxbury's would be almost 12 cents lower. So you'll see big swings going the opposite direction. The dollar yield is a favorable impact, CLA and the loss of that um, merger incentive is a negative. Um, but when everything is all factored in together and settles out, it's less than a penny. And we are able to pull that community liaison position into the local budget. Now realize, as I mentioned, some of those things are still unknown. So some things could still change. So I don't wanna to get too excited yet. But right now we're looking good. Next, Anna. The next slide shows the tax rate impact. Um, I'm afraid Anna has a hard time hearing me through the system here. There we go. Um, <laughs> since the estimated tax rates were pretty much level as you saw on that last slide, um, the impacts are really minimal. So you can see for every $100,000, Montpelier would have a $3 decrease in a tax bill. For Roxbury, it's a $4 increase because it's 0.3 cents and 0.4 cents. Um, so very minimal changes. Uh, and you know we'll keep refreshing this as we have changes in the tax rates. So next, please. And the next slide that you're gonna see is that tax rate history that shows you the line charts. And basically is a kind of a reminder that, um, that we're in pretty good shape compared to where we were before we merged. 
So the and in fact, in fact, if you look at this, the only negative trend is Montpelier's tax rate with CLA factored in, which we can't control the CLA. Everything else looks good compared to when we merged. Um, Montpelier's tax rate with without CLA is 15 cents lower than back in 18. And in Roxbury, even if you factor in CLA, which we can't control, it's 25 cents lower than before we merged. So each year you may kind of have a different perspective, but if you go all the way back to before the merger, we're doing pretty good. So next, please. Oh, okay, so I should just start talking. Yeah, yeah. just start talking, it'll come up. So the next slide is the Outlook slide, which, which was provided in the last briefing. I just leave it in here because it's good to keep these things in mind because you don't only want to think about the budget you're building. You want to think about the budget you're building and, and what the next budget and the budget after that might look like as far as tax rates and managing things. So I just wanted to remind people reappraisals are ha happening right now. That'll be a big impact next year. Montpelier should see a big drop in their tax rate. Now realize your tax, um, your assessed, your appraised values of your houses are gonna go up though. So a higher value with a lower rate will probably keep you at about the same place. But the tax rate itself will go down significantly. Um, Libby's talked about the new equalized pupil count and the weighting that they're, the weighting study. When that hits, it could decrease our numbers dramatically because as I mentioned, some of our percentages aren't as high as other places. So like free and reduced percentage is lower than maybe some others. Um, ELL may not be as high as others. So we could actually see a drop in equalized pupil count. My hope is that if that is significant, it will be transitioned across time. If it's a drop of say 50 kids, that it would be maybe 10 kids per year for five years or something along those lines, some kind of a hold harmless in the uh, legislation perhaps. Um, enrollment and staffing, we've talked about this. Um, enrollment is pretty stable. In the higher grades, we're still seeing that increase. In the lower grades is where we see, we're seeing the decrease. But overall, we're pretty stable. Um, the merger incentive, this is the last year we have to worry about um, it, um, absorbing that impact of the two cents being gone because we're already at zero. So that's not gonna be an issue in the future. So the next slide is just the budget summary that talks about the total budget increase is four and a half, ed spending is four. Spending per pupil is four, which makes sense because I haven't changed our equalized pupil count yet because I don't know what that's gonna be. Residential tax rates, that's the good news for tonight. Uh, it's a decrease of 0.3 cents in, in Montpelier. And if you remember last time we talked, it was looking like it could be as much as 9.3 cents increase. So fantastic. In Roxbury, it's a 0.4 cent increase instead of a 9.7 increase. And then the next slide is just a reminder that our ARP ESSER uh, plan is public and can be found at the URL that shows up on the slide for anybody to start digging into. Um, some of that would come into play is not part of our budget. The only thing in our budget is the ESSER funded positions, the proposed ESSER funded positions that we've talked about, which is a small amount of the ESSER funds. Um, but if we start talking about projects, including the projects that our students were just talking about, that might come into play in um, in the ESSER funds that aren't necessarily part of the budget or in infrastructure funds, which aren't part of the budget. And then the last slide is actually kicking it back to you. Um, if you have any questions or concerns that I should be looking at between now and the fifth, which is, I guess, technically we call it a public forum. So if there's anything you need from me or any questions, I'll be happy to try to address it. So I'm gonna open up a question. I'm actually gonna go head down the hall. My son is playing in the concert. So Have fun. About to start. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Andrew, and I will. I'm gonna actually gonna take my stuff in case it's not too long. Or this board meeting is shorter than anticipated. But um, uh, 
but I'll turn over to you, Andrew. And thank you very much, Grant. It was um, an excellent presentation, and the tax news is always good to hear. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Have fun. Jill? I just had a quick question, and this may not be something you can answer. I feel like I just read this week that there was some court decision about teacher health care benefits and the required payment. Maybe Montpelier Roxbury already provides health care. It's something about the copay is increasing for some school districts because of this court case. I don't know. Like the arbitration. Yeah. Um, the statewide arbitration, yeah. that, that is happening. And um, we should be in pretty good shape there. Um, one thing is it doesn't take effect until it's based on a calendar year. So it would only be half of this year that we're talking about because it would be January 1st of 2023. Okay. And most of what I've seen in the statewide agreement is in alignment with what we offer. The only difference was um, an out-of-pocket maximum amount that I'm trying to think of, was it teachers and administrators? And it was like $200 less out-of-pocket. Yeah, so for the for the teachers and administrators, it's like $200 for a single plan and $400 for a two-person or family plan that is lower for them, which we would have to bump up. Okay. So worst case scenario for some of our employer employees for half the year, we may have a little bit more money that we would have to kick in for like the HRA, HSA. Okay. Um, but the other thing is, as you know, we've talked about this before, we don't see 100% utilization of our HRAs and HSAs anyway. Um, so I'm not overly concerned, but it is it is a factor that okay. between now and the fifth, we might look at it again. And if we think it's enough of a risk, we might plug something else in, but I think we'll be okay. I think there's a lot of other districts that maybe are in worse shape than, than us maybe. And Grant, I just I just want to provide clarification for the public and any members of the board who aren't familiar. This is the second um, statewide teachers health care agreement that is being put in place. The first was two years, right? Yeah. We're in the middle. We're it was in the like middle two and of a right half, now. but really two yeah. calendar years, I think. Yeah, yeah, two, yeah that's right. Two and a half. Um, and that was a that was a change before that healthcare agreements were negotiated at the individual district level. Yeah. It didn't impact our district very much, that change. And, it's, and it isn't actually, I think a large driver is the, is the teachers, the NEA, but it impacts all employees. And everything I've seen for all support service, uh, support um, employees, it's identical to what we have now. It's only teachers and administrators that is a little different for out-of-pocket max. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah. I have another clarifying one. Um, on the This is actually on the, the ETSER public plan, which I know we're not talking about right now, but just because they do kind of intersect with the budget. There's a, there's a great list of all the different sources of um, federal funding, uh, section three of it. The very last one is called other funding sources to achieve recovery goals and is also like $2.5 million, whereas our BESSER 3 is 2.23. I was just curious, what, what are some of those funding sources? Is, is that the line that has um, the potential for infrastructure, an infrastructure package? Where are you? Um, well, if you click on my M, you'll go to where I have the cursor, I think. You should be able to do that. That's oh, my I, cursor. I'm actually, I have my own. I'm in section three. It's the grid that starts with the, has like, Funding source no, allocation. That's actually, I believe that's a. Uh, it's 2.553, but then the context for SR3 is in the notes. Yeah. And then SR3 oh, is oh, listed oh, above. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know. Okay. So remember, thanks, man. <laughs> yeah. I clicked on the context. I was like, oh, yeah, I know this. <laughs> Good. That was, that's like local funds. Remember we talked about how when we first started the SR, our SR conversation, it was like, um, it was really important to, to put the goals of the recovery through the lens of what we are currently doing and how much local funds we're currently spending um, on things like social work, people like social workers, guidance counselors. So that context there, that document, yeah. 
was from this budget year, not okay. next budget year, but this right. budget year for the buckets that the recovery plan was in. Remember so, we had that conversation. Got it. So the 2.5 million are local funds we are spending this year right. that meet some of the recovery. requirements yes. or whatever. Okay. Yeah. So it's not money we can expect coming in. No, it's not <laughs> new money. It's money we are already spending. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That should probably be clear in the public plan. I'll make a note to myself. All right. Yeah. Grant, you, you mentioned the one position that moving out of ESSER. Um, does that mean we lose out on the ESSER funds or? The, no, or it's, that it, um, that position was actually funded for, um, we plan to fund it for two years using ESSER two money. Um, so it actually opens up ESSER two money for something else. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what we're going to talk about that maybe next week to see what else we might want to do with that availability. Um, ESSER two is a little more flexible even than ESSER three. So it doesn't stop us from using it. We'll use it. We'll just use it for something else. But the exciting thing for me is I've seen how important that position is. And now to know that it's not relying on federal funds anymore. I can breathe a, a sigh of relief that it is, it's going to be in the budget now and it'll be secure. Yeah, that, so, yeah, that does make sense. I was just curious. Yeah, what, we what would happens. still be able to so use we'll it. We'll be looking it's, at what we want to, so it frees up ESSER two funds. So we, we've actually been talking the last couple of weeks or last couple of days. If we were, if we move the communities on that ESSER two, what then will we use ESSER two from? Because the deadline for for uh, applying for all of those funds in ESSER two is. Um, yeah, it's coming up. So not to use them, but to, to apply for them. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we've been talking about that. For instance, one idea we have, then that's the next question, right? Is uh, the internet outages that we were experiencing the last two weeks was due to our security cameras and um, archaic security cameras across the district having to upload new software to try to support them that totally messed up our internet and opened us up to some outside miscreants trying to get into our system, which is why our internet was so fluky for a whole week and a half. So we've talked um, about upgrading our security system, our security camera system across the district, mainly it's, because of that. And it's so bad that the company that actually installed it back in the day, they don't even exist anymore. So yeah. there's no way, there's nobody providing service to, to help with any kind of problems we have. So, so, it's, so that's kind no of just support. popped up. And so we're, it's an expense, it's a big expense about what we were using to pay next salary, mm -hmm. ironically enough. So we were like, would that be something that, so we wouldn't have to, you know, top up fund balance for that because we put that in that strategy. That's just an idea that we're throwing around. Is that something that would be eligible for us to do things? We think so. We're not okay. positive. That's a question that we're still working on. Okay. We think so. I really we've like, come up with an argument or two. <laughs> of course. I, I like that approach too because we're taking that ongoing structural cost, building it into the budget, especially in such a good budget year, like yeah. we're experiencing. Um, and then using that money for yeah, and that, that, that would be a one time, that would be a relatively uh, on a longer duration one time expense, yes. which would be perfect for SR2 funds. Right. So that does make sense. Um just out of curiosity, Libby, you mentioned equalized pupils and we had outside consulting um, uh -huh. firm to come in. Uh -huh. uh, just out of curiosity, was that a net, what, what was the net effect that you guys figured out? Well, the equalized we people yeah. okay, we, went we, up or because of that it went down? Well, no, it went up. It went for up. Our count went up. Okay. For, so okay. we are now counting more pupils than we have before. That's a good thing. Right? That's a very good thing. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll see if it nets out with what the AOE comes back with. <laughs> In terms of equalized pupils, but but um, yeah. so so how does this work? The, we submit this, and then the AOE has to approve it. Are they correct? No, we submit it. Grant probably knows better than I do. We submit it, and then they have some mathematical formula that nobody quite understands, <laughs> except for Brad James. And yeah, exactly. Who's the guy at the AOE, and and they spit out the equalized number to us. So what we what we submit is basically the average daily membership. And so we submit that for last last year, or this, yeah, last year, and we just submitted it for this year. 
So our data that we feed in is the average daily membership. And that's the data that we know now is good, solid data, whereas we were having problems before. The challenge and why I say it's kind of a mystery is because once that kicks in, I have no idea, you know, Brad James is a person at the Agency of Education. He puts that in and then he collects the data on all the free and reduced percentages, the ELL percentages, the pre-K numbers for every district, runs that across and puts in all those weighted factors, applies all those, and then it comes out to a number and that number would end up being like 113,000 kids. And then of course, there's only like 90,000 kids in Vermont. So then he applies some factor to everybody to bring it down to 90,000. So that's why even though we might have our ADM each year going up and I get all excited thinking, oh, I can't wait to see the equalized pupil. If other people have even bigger increases or bigger percentages for some of those weighted factors, even though our ADM goes up, our equalized people could end up going down. So it's, it's a really almost impossible thing. I mean, if, if you get frustrated by the tax rate calculation, you'd really get frustrated by trying to make sense of the equalized pupil count. But our piece is that ADM, and because of this company that we've begun working with, we feel really good about the quality of our data. So if it goes down, it's not gonna be because of us. It'll be because of just statewide factors. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Linda, am I right? Any questions? Well, first, I want to thank you mm -hmm. <laughs> for everything that you do all the time. Thank you for the terminology. That was really helpful to just have that. And for the tax rate history, that was very helpful for me. And then I have a, a newbie question around the conservative numbers and what your experience has been when you play with those numbers being conservative like what happens once you put in the numbers the budget passes and then so what is, what is the yeah i think last year we actually looked at some of this because last year we had a dollar yield was it just last year because i i actually looked really good one year because I, I didn't use the dollar yield that the tax commissioner provided. And I it wasn't it was not because year. the tax commissioner made an error. It's just because we knew some economic factors had changed. So I used a more favorable dollar yield and it ended up being within like $3 or at, at the very end. So that was a good thing. The problem this year is I have never seen since we started with the new way to calculate, I've never seen a dollar yield do what this is looking like it's going to do. It's never gone up by that much. Um, so when I say conservative, I'm taking the lower number out of the, out of the recommendation. Um, if I took the higher number, then the tax rate would even be lower, but it's just so unheard of that the dollar yield has gone that high in one year. That's why I'm a little nervous about doing that. Whereas in the past, I have not been afraid of using a higher yield, but this year I just don't have any kind of, any insight that would lead me to believe that I should vary from what's in there. Um, so a conservative number there is, is, is not helping the tax rate. You know, a more aggressive number would make the tax rate lower. For CLA, I'm taking a conservative, fairly conservative number because I think the CLA has a real, real chance this year of dropping dramatically because now we have two really high sales um, data numbers out of the three years because it's three year average. Mm -hmm. Two out of three years now are going to be really high sales numbers. So I'm trying to be conserv a little conservative there to make sure that we don't get a bad surprise. Um, the good news is for the CLA, we're gonna know that pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And so on January 5th, when we do the public forum, that's one big unknown that will be known. So then it's really just whether we have any insight and Andrew is better at this than me, but at some point, if there's more insight into the statewide economic health that leads us to believe that we should do something different to that dollar yield, then we'll bring that to you. I will tell you that almost every colleague I have, they use the tax commissioner's number. And the AOE unofficially recommended that we use the lower number. Um, 
And I think it would make sense, you know, if I was king for a day, this is, this is a great number and tax rate, rates are in a good place. This is a great opportunity to capture that $90,000 surplus and put it in the bank while we have a chance. So I'm hoping that that's what they do. Was there any other yeah. conservative number that was? No, I, yeah, no, I'm just trying to translate it into mm -hmm. what happens. So once, the, once it passes, the, our numbers are, like those unknowns are gone. The only, whenever we go in for the informational hearing, the day before town meeting, everything is gonna be solid with the exception of the dollar yield, okay. which gets set by law. Okay. And, you know, it, it's always like that. Um, the legislature sets it after voters vote on budgets. And a lot of times it does end up getting set higher than what, it's frustrating because you fight to try to get a budget passed with a, with a tax rate that ends up being higher than what it really is, you know? Um, but this year, I just, I just don't know how it's gonna play out. In, in recent years, um, the there have been budgets there there have been budget surpluses, and especially before the pandemic, because the economy was performing at a reliable reliably healthy rate, and uh, the governor and legislature were coming to agreement on a number of policies, which included essentially keeping tax rates pretty level for a number of years, and they did that by boosting the dollar yield from what was initially anticipated. That's like high level kind of explanation. Now the one number that isn't, well, I guess it might be considered conservative. The equalized pupil count is still an unknown. And by keeping it level, I thought initially maybe I was being conservative, but I, it really is in a, a pure unknown for me. So I, I, right now, I think the best guess is just to leave it where it was this year and then wait for it. And hopefully we will have a pretty solid number by January 5th on that one too. Um, I expect by next week, probably, to get at least the first draft from the AOE. Okay. Emma. <clears throat> Um, I mean, I don't have very many questions, and I think that's sort of attributed to how clear you have been presenting these uh, budget presentations. So I really appreciate the clarity and sort of the educational tone that you take when you're, when you're presenting it to us. Um, it's really helpful. Can you tell me, um, has there, I mean, as long as I've been following, I don't think I remember seeing a drop in taxpayer, you know, in the in the amount that people will be paying on their house. Have, have you seen a drop in the past like 10 years or so? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I was just talking to Christina about a chart that we threw in there last year that showed tax rates. I mean, and, and it's hard because there's two different tax rates, right? Because of the CLA, right. Roxbury yep. versus Montpelier. But just to take a snapshot, I have a slide that shows the change in education spending from year to year and what that looks like. Yeah. And then I have in a little text box, what the tax rate did that year. Yeah. In the first year, the the ed spending went up like a million dollars, and the tax rate went down like 0.2. In the next year, it was only like a four hundred thousand dollar increase, and the tax rate went up like eight cents or something. There's like no correlation between our spending right and the final tax rate. Um, but I will say, I think it was in FY19, the year after the merger, the tax rates were lower. And I don't, there shouldn't have been any kind of reappraisal. So theoretically, people should have seen lower tax rates uh, in Montpelier in 19. And I think for several years, Roxbury should have seen it because the year before the merger, they were hit with that excess penalty, um, yeah. excess spending penalty, which meant they got double taxed. So in FY18, their tax rate was really high. Okay. And so they have seen decreases, I would, I would say probably in multiple years. Yeah. But for Montpelier, I think since I've been here, the, the actual tax rate, I think has only gone down once. So with any luck, this could be the second. But. Yeah. I mean, I think people are going to be really happy and just with the federal funding that's coming our way and the healthy uh, fund balance, it's 
you know, we've been able to present a budget that I think is really generous and, and good for the district and still see a savings. So I'm really impressed with that. Um, my other question, and I don't know if we need to spend time on it tonight, but just based on the um, public input that we received from the students, um, I mean, in that moment when they were giving their feedback or, you know, their uh, testimony, I was thinking like, is there something that we can give them just sort of like a little bullet point of progress and where we're at and some of the things that are in the ESSER spending, ESSER spending um, proposals that might be speaking to the net zero you know, mission. And I think the other part of their testimony was to ask, be asking us for a pol an actual policy mm -hmm. or a plan. So that's, that could be dealt with separately and maybe the policy committee could reach out to, um, the, it was called the Earth Group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but so I don't know if there's like a very quick, like 30 second kind of overview of some of the stuff that we've done, because I know, you. I mean, obviously there's windows um, are happening in the capital plan and I'm sure there's other yeah, things. Yeah, we also, that... we buy into a solar field. So we have, we I'm, offset. I'm not going to say it exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> we need Andrew LaRosa here, but uh, we do work with a uh, solar field through a student. It was a student presentation who brought it to us a couple of years ago. And Andrew worked with that student. I think the student's uncle owns it or something like that. <laughs> um, but I can get Andrew and Larissa to talk more about that if you'd like. We also, we couldn't get a contractor to do it, but we have purchased and have ready to go heat pumps over at Roxbury. Um, we just couldn't find somebody to do it in the fall. So mm -hmm. that's on target to get accomplished. And the heat pumps at Roxbury was something that they presented to us as one of a big yes. thing that could really help. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that will happen. We right. have we have them. Yeah, <laughs> we've yeah. ordered them. We just can't get anybody to put them in there. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that will happen in the spring. Before we did that, we did a lot. Uh, we did. I had uh, Andrew do a mold and um, just an assessment of air quality at Roxbury too, um, to make sure that there weren't, you know, we weren't going to put heat pumps in to hide any problems because of the moisture that that building can suck in being at the bottom of a hill. Um, so we did that big testing and it came out great actually, it came out much better than we actually thought it would. Um, we've also, Andrew, Andrew's so much better than this, <laughs> he's looked into different heating sources here and Andrew's professional opinion, we should wait for the infrastructure piece. There's a challenge to it. So when you're talking about different types of heating sources that have been brought to the attention to the board, you're also talking about like putting silos up. And so it, that would take away from fields. Uh, you know, we have a limited amount of space to do some of the work. So um, Andrew really would like to wait for infrastructure dollars to really think about those kind of big ticket items because mm -hmm. they are very expensive to do when you're talking about usage of space um, that are currently pretty used. You know, if you come out here on a fall day, there's not a green space that doesn't have a team on it. Um, so we've been talking about that too. And we've we spent a considerable money from the CRF bucket, which was focused on heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. And a lot of that was not only just to improve air quality, but a little thing like um, changing to variable speed motors so that like when you didn't need it, it would slow down and not use as much electricity. There was a lot of that kind of stuff that was going on that's, that's ventilation related that people wouldn't know about. And I'm sure that, and I'd have to go back, but Andrew does, what's the, the calls it a facilities the plan? Facilities overview, yeah. So there's a lot of stuff in there. There's a lot. And yeah. it might be a good thing for him to do a presentation that just focuses on efficiency issues. Yeah. Because we have done a lot that people wouldn't know because you know, we probably don't do a great, as good of a job as we can trying to yeah. toot our own horn like you know every vehicle we have is electric or hybrid almost yeah well vehicle. almost yeah but like the the driver's ed vehicle is a complete electric vehicle which we did do try to do some press on that but um you know not a whole lot but yeah you know, we got hybrid vans and so we've done a lot but 
you know, we, we could be better at trying to make sure people knew about it. Yeah, I get that sense. And so I guess that's what I'm I'm hoping to, you know, maybe I'll reach out to you, Libby, just to see if we can maybe circle back to the earth group and, and provide them with some of that information. Or, yeah, and if the board would like, once we get through the budgeting yeah. process, to yeah. have Andrew come do his, this is what we've done in terms of work towards um, climate with our buildings and structures and things we have control over. Um, this is where we could grow should the board want to move in that direction this is andrew's opinion of those things because he certainly has them uh, but we he's, we'd be more than happy to have him come in to do that and maybe we can invite the, the, the earth, the earth, students, yeah. the earth group to that presentation and maybe and that sort of andrew meets with them regularly <laughs> so they already know what yeah. we're doing yeah. okay um, and uh, one oh. of the big things that we do that that people might not know is we have we're part of the district heat with the city so union elementary school gets their heat through the city's district heat which is i think um wood pellet yeah, yeah. um and we're it actually costs a lot um it, it costs more than heating other buildings but that's because it was related to a bond and so at some point that should come back down but but that that is one building that is definitely participating with the city hand in hand yeah um but just as a reminder, it's and you you called it out. It's not really something to do with the budget because what we what we did was we just put in positions that we really feel strongly about that relate to Esser. The big chunk of like projects that we could do, we we intentionally didn't put in here because you know we don't have solid estimates for some of them. We yeah. we couldn't say that we've really finished all the engagement that we want to do to be able to say these are the projects and. Also, we haven't gotten approval from the AOE through the grant process to even say if, if they're valid and they would approve them. Mm -hmm. um, but that is a bucket of money that is available that if we can look into it and it makes sense, we certainly could um, spend it in ways that support that. Um, but yeah, not part of this. The, the, yeah. yeah, thank you for that. The big part of this, um, and this came up in our couple of facilities meetings that we've had, and then the city, I think it's BEIC who just issued this energy audit for the city that looked at public public buildings and greenhouse okay. gas emissions. And MSMS and MHS are the, the largest emitters and it's on the thermal side, it's on the heat side. And the big uh, recommendation coming out of that report, which was kind of higher level, it wasn't super in the weeds the way some other energy audits are. Like if you were to have an energy audit of your house, it would get into like that in detail. Um, but the, the, the recommendation was um, if we wanted to really reduce greenhouse gas emissions for this building and MSMS, where again, very limited space over there, um, is to put in uh, like biomass boilers. One of the things that came up, and I was just talking with Mia about this, and I'll keep this really brief, that's come up when I've been talking with people around the community because I'm not an expert at all in pellet boilers, biomass boilers, absolutely not. So don't, I'm not pretending to be. An issue that's been brought up to me by some people who work in the public health space as well as in uh, the conservation space is the end of pipe emissions of biomass. If we were to add that to what we already have in this city, there one public health professional brought up concerns about asthma rates related to um, re related to these types of systems. So that's something that I think we'd want to evaluate with the greenhouse gas emission part. It's a, it's, it's a difficult situation to be in. How do you keep these large buildings um, in a way that's healthy for the planet and healthy for the community? I think, you know, that's the big question for us. Amanda? Um, it's a different topic. No problem. Just like, Please, new paragraph. <laughs> moving away, just like thinking and dreaming and uh, thinking long term that as we evolve as a board to do this community engagement and the people coming in to bring in these things, that we really should be thinking about how to respond and how to keep like tap somehow of like here are some of the issues that have been brought and give reports, like whether it's like really, you know, like one page or so, of, hey, the community asks about climate. Here are the things we're doing. Hey, the community asked. And just to be that engaged with the community. So like, we're doing all these things, but we should know that we're doing all these things. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so I think like 
being able to have that as something that we do when we're thinking communication, that's part of like a communication strategy. So like, just that it is needed to listen and give feedback back, right? Like, and have this evolving mechanism long-term that this is how we, as a district, listens and responds to concerns, ideas, and, you know, what can, can we result? I don't know, how, like, how to implement that or, like, what is as a board that will put, you know, or is that something, yeah. So that's to throw out there because it's so important when budget time comes around and just, like, have that be, like, we're already doing that and here are the things that we are doing. I wholeheartedly support that statement and just feel like, it's been a kind of a struggle because we've been doing these listening sessions and with the student listening session, for example, I emailed everyone the, the list of things that they had brought up and sort of wanted to fill in the blanks and provide, you know, some feedback to the student group uh, of like where we're at as a district or a board on some of their concerns. And it's going to end up taking months to get back to them. It's just the slow, <laughs> the wheels of democracy <laughs> turn slowly and we're all very busy. Um, so yeah, I, I think it would be really great to sort of build in a mechanism to be more, a little more responsive. I think with the students, our plan, if I'm not mistaken, Emma, after our correspondence lately is we are doing a lot of things already that they're asking for. And it's important to highlight that. And this budget also incorporates some ideas that students have brought forward. So my plan grant, I'll be reaching out about a couple of items just to fact check some things. Yeah. Um, but our plan is, I think, late January, get back to that big group of students with an overview of what we have been doing and what this budget includes that addresses some of the some of the issues and concerns and priorities that brought to us. Yeah. That's just an example. Um, so community engagement discussion, this seems like a good opportunity to pivot there. Okay. Good oh, opportunity oh, for me to leave, too. Oh, I'm sorry, Rhett. I'm sorry, Rhett. Sort of budget related. Yeah, yeah, please. We'll um, when it comes to identifying the need for individual assistance, which we have many open positions, how do you determine where you need one? or And how do you, how does that compete with the many opening? You know, how does that, how do you factor in the fact that there are so many positions that can't be filled? Yeah. Good question, because we, that was part of our discussion as we were planning the budget this year, actually. Um, so how would they determine our multiple facets, right? The major one is that the IEP team around a student would decide whether or not a student needed additional instructional support, right? That's, that's an IEP team decision based on a student with special needs. Another might be just a school need. So for instance, you, it's really hard to run an elementary school without somebody out there monitoring recess and lunch. Uh, and in our teacher contract for Union Elementary School, teachers are, don't do that. So you need somebody to do that, right? So it would be an instructional assistant who typically takes on that role. Um, another thing we thought about that's besides the, well, it's kind of connected to the IEP process, but it's not. That we have students, flexible pathways, students who go to all kinds of different things during the day, go to high school to be rides. And so we've talked about, are we paying a, a faculty member, a teacher, or even an administrator, a pretty high salary to drive students around, right? Could that be done by somebody else? So that's a different piece that we've thought about. Um, but this year in particular, in the budget conversation, we have we talked, administrator said, I need an IA for, like driving was a, mm -hmm. was a good example for flex pathways. And Grant's able to say, well, we have eight openings right now. We have IEP services covered for the most part right now. Maybe not with the person ideally that we want to cover, but we have them covered. And IEs right now are strapped, absolutely. I'm looking at Carla Kinnaman's name on the, on the public, who's one of our absolutely fabulous IAs at Union Elementary School. Um, and they may be rarely strapped. However, we've got the needs covered, but Grant's saying we got eight openings still because we never have riffed any of those positions because it's a union position. So if you lose an IA position, you're riffing it. 
but we've just continued to budget for it. Mm -hmm. They've just gone as unfilled positions. So when I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you, Amanda. I'm sorry. Production in force. So um, instead, instead of adding an IA position to for the van for flexible pathways, Grant said, could we use one of the open positions as part of their job description would be to drive students around. Um, so we had lots of conversations around that piece. In the Thrive, two for Thrive programs? Yeah, for the, for, for the alternative programming for um, social emotional behavior and social skills. We talked about if we have all these openings for instructional assistance, then when we're able to hire, we're hiring with the idea of looking at the Thrive or the RISE program at UES. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Is it common for IAs to move in as substitutes when the need comes up? And is that are they frequently yes. being pushed in a lot of different directions and unable this to do? This year they are. <laughs> and, and sort of unable to provide that support? Yeah. This year they are. Um, we do have it in their contract. We've, uh, we've negotiated in the last contract a pay structure for IAs who, if we can't find a substitute, if they take that substitute role, then they get an additional payment for that piece. Yep. Because I'm not sure how much the, 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 the wider board is aware, but historically at Roxbury, I mean, in any classroom, you have two ends, sort of. The side that needs a lot of support and the side that needs a lot of effort just to challenge them. And when you're talking about a first and a second grade in one room, that spectrum is so much wider. Third and fourth grade in one room, so much wider, especially with I mean, maybe with less kids, it's even wider because you don't have as common a middle ground as you would in a larger classroom, potentially. I'm not sure. I just, that's sort of the spirit of the question of the IAs and how that gets used. And I know that the per pupil spending is high, but it's a historical problem that a lot of kids are feeling like, oh, I'm actually bored. Yeah, I don't know if hiring a structural assistance would solve that. Wouldn't help. I, I don't know. I'm not saying it would or it wouldn't, um, but when we're talking about educating our children, our instructional assistants are an essential part of that piece, particularly for kids who have needs that are executive function type needs, or you know, if there's a learning impairment, we're addressing might be an issue or um, some sort of some sort of movement challenge or, or speech or toileting or something like that. Um, However, if you're talking about addressing the needs of a classroom solely, then I would argue that any classroom has that range as a former first and second grade teacher. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I think there are different, there are different things we want to look at than adding an instructional assistant into that space. I'm not sure if that would be the answer to solve that. So I'm sensitive to the time. It's 7.36. Is, is it everybody all right moving on to community engagement? <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Be well, Grant. Thank you. Community engagement discussion. Is this the 15 minutes that we added on previously? Yeah. I believe it is. Mia, do you want to take this? Yeah, I'm not sure we need the time um, because I think we covered it in the okay. last meeting, but why don't I just recap where I think we landed and that way people can say, oh, that's not what I thought it was, and then we do need the time. Sounds good. <laughs> um, well, what we were focused on in the last meeting was community engagement, um, particularly of communities, uh, our, our BIPOC families, families with LGBTQIA kiddos, um, families with kiddos on uh, with special ed, potentially literacy as well. And um, I'm looking at Amanda and then also Kristen, because we talked about this at the equity committee on Tuesday. Uh, we also talked about um, a listening session with Roxbury families. All of it focused on the, uh, the work, the get, gathering input that we can share then with the administration as they think about and land an ESSER three um, plan. And uh, where we, where I think we landed last board meeting was that the board thought that was an important thing to do, such that we are going to offer that support to the administration ourselves and facilitate those listening sessions and then hand over what we gather in a nutshell. Is where, and so that's 
Yeah, that, that's as I recall it too. Um, does anybody have any questions? Want any further discussion on this? I actually have a question. No one else does. Um, did, does the equity committee, are you think, are you going to come back to the board with a proposal about this is how we'd like to handle this? How, how do, how do you suggest we move forward with this? We can share that right now. Great. <laughs> um, we, we had the date of January 15th in mind that they, that was a deadline to get information mm -hmm. to Libby and the other administrators. So Amanda and Kristen are, uh, organizing the listening sessions for the first week awesome. of January or the beginning of that following week so that we have the information and we get it to the administration. And I think that's as simple as that. Is, is it the type of thing where it would be helpful for a bunch of board members to attend or do we think it would be better to have fewer board members? What good, is the suggestion? Good, good question. Um, we're thinking specifically about, uh, we really like these to be affinity spaces mm -hmm. so that folks have that, that common ground and that comfort level with sharing what their concerns and dreams are. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, would you like to, step, to share who you have? Sure. So I will be, so I have someone that will help me facilitate from a community member who will help me facilitate the, all of the sessions from that, from that identity. So, um, and so I have a, someone already from the disability of the special ed, which is who's the executive director of the new organization named All Brains Belong in Vermont. And she's going to help me um, facilitate a special ed conversation. I'm meeting with her on Friday actually for coffee. I have the BIPOC affinity space. I have my friend, Sarika Tandon, who's a racial justice um, activist, former member of the district-wide equity committee. She's gonna help me facilitate the BIPOC group. I can be part of both uh, the special ed and BIPOC because I, both my kids have, so I have an IEP. So I will be taking notes and just being there present uh, for both the BIPOC and the, and the and I'm also gonna get someone from the LGBTQ community. Um, I would not be in that one because that is an opinion space. I'm asking someone from there to take notes and make sure that we have, you know, like the format that they need. If any of us identifies us. Um, Mara might be a good person. Who? Mara Iverson. Mara Iverson. Yes, yes. But I'm saying like from the board, if anybody yeah. identifies as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, that could be a space for you. Um, if not, then we'll have a committee member that can come. And you're saying also- Mara is a consultant now. Um, I'm committing with Upright tomorrow, but if we have money to pay Mara to help facilitate, um, I will not ask her to do it for free. Um, but, you know, we could pay her a stipend. But I'm meeting with uh, B from Upright tomorrow to see, having lunch, see if she will help, help me facilitate that one. But I also have Julia as well so I should have. Uh, we've agreed before that that was a few staff members too that might be interested in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then um, we did get that email from Angela and a few other ones that want to have that literacy conversation. Um, I was gonna reach out. Me, I was gonna, I was gonna include me yeah. to do the triage um, to have that conversation to see since we haven't really landed whether or not they're gonna to come to present to us or you know, what we should do. And then Kristen, do you wanna talk about Roxbury and what we talk about you want to? Sure. Yeah, can you all hear me okay? Yeah, you sound okay, great. great. Uh, yeah, so we discussed having a listening session in Roxbury. Um, I think what came to mind for me after seeing the um, report from the infrastructure thought exchange is that we had two respondents that identified as Roxbury community members, which gave me some concern that, you know, are we getting the Roxbury voice here? Um, I have been doing a little bit more groundwork to get the thought exchange circulated um, in Roxbury. I know um, Beth Kellogg, the principal at RBS, put it out in uh, the, the weekly buzz and RDSPTO put it out and just been doing some outreach to folks kind of directly. Um, but I just want to make sure that we're definitely capturing the Roxbury community voice um, around, around these topics and so that we have kind of a limited window. Also, I know we only have two more days left in the thought exchange and I don't know what our community's participation has been and I don't know what our 
the timing for the report would be Libby, but I just want to really make sure that we're capturing Roxbury folks around um, the ESSER 3 topic. So uh, we are able to use the Roxbury Free Library as a space and um, just I know Amanda has a number of facilitators that she's coordinating with for her meeting. So once she has hers lined up, we're kind of going to figure out where Roxbury can fall in the lineup in terms of scheduling. Kristen, one thing on the thought exchange that I just realized, it's kind of in the way that we set it up, it's kind of impossible to know how many Roxbury parents have done it because it's the, the choices are parents or guardian of a MRPS student. Like it's not by school. It's not by but can you, can you check? Head. But can you check multiple? Yeah, you can check multiple. And there's another one for a Roxbury community member. So that right. might be a person who lives in Roxbury who doesn't have a child in the school. Right. I guess I was also thinking, I mean, maybe there's Roxbury parents who are kind of just checking, you know, the parent caregiver box and not also checking the, um, right. the that, that, could totally, that could totally be happening but it's you can't you can't tell right. how many Roxbury people have participated right well, I think the Montpelier and it could be just community members but that registered at something like 42 <clears throat> so when I saw that I was like oh you know we should definitely do some kind of targeted outreach to, to Roxbury in case I mean that's capturing a reality in terms of feedback yeah, I just don't know if you could, if we can say, I can't tell how many Roxbury people have. Right. Filled it yeah. Out. It seems like it can't hurt, you know, to yeah. do a little bit I just more. Make sure that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Anything else on that? I, I personally really appreciate this. Thank you all for the work that I've been doing. Uh, there's, there's, I have a question. There is a attempt at discussing Roxbury Village Schools comprehensive needs assessment on Monday. And is, can any of that information overlap and inform any of this or is it separate from this or? I didn't know if that was that. That's, that that's something that's school? being facilitated by Beth. Uh-huh. And I don't, and I don't, it, can any of that information, it yeah, can? Absolutely, okay. absolutely bring it to us. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Just making um, sure that there's so many different, <laughs> there's so many different outreach initiatives and I don't know where exactly, they all seem very much overlapping in many ways. That's a, that's a part of every leadership conversation we have around this kind of stuff. So she definitely brings that to the table. We're, we're, we're promoting that as much as we can. Yep. I wanted to clarify, Amanda, would, do you feel like it would be appropriate in the LGBTQIA group listening session if anybody on the board has a, um, a child or a student in the district who also identifies that way, would they be then potentially invited to that? Okay. I just wanted, because I wasn't sure, you know, the, you having a student that has an IEP is pretty different. Yes experience than having a child. I don't know. So I wasn't sure if that was, would translate. As yeah, no, no. I think if you have space. if you have um, a child that is identified with LGBT that IQA community, I mean the students are also invited, but it is like if you have a child, yeah. especially if you have a child that is yeah. so, yes. Okay. Do we do we want to do an additional equity committee update on top of that? Or? We can just add a couple more things. Okay. That's the big one. Yeah, that's, that, I mean, one. That's, that's our biggest priority. Second priority is the um, school climate survey. So Andrew has agreed he's going to be reaching out to the teachers union so we can start hopefully like beginning of the new year, start yeah. um, working with them on finalizing that. In the minutes from our meeting on Tuesday, which is in the board packet, you can see we drafted a, a timeline so that for not just the finalization of writing the survey, but also all the way through to teachers taking the survey, yeah. giving us their feedback, and us having a report. So yeah. just that's, I won't read those dates off because they're in our minutes. Um, that's, Thank you for, for doing that. Sure. Those are two really big ones. 
the other just things on our sort of grand to do list are um, we think we can might be the place to incubate the new board member packet. Uh, so we're gonna we'll we'll take that on and um, and then as as the policy committee assigns us policies for review. So that's our general. We just wanted to give an update on kind of what we're seeing as our scope of work for the next several months. Did anyone, I miss anything, Amanda, Kristen? Anyone have any questions for the equity committee? And also the equity tool that came out of the equity committee and the policy committee right. a couple of meetings ago. That's a lot. Thank you. Yeah. I have well a quick follow up because we're transitioning to a policy. Has the policy committee been using that tool? Has it found it helpful so far? I realize that's been a bunch of time. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely moving at a very slow pace. Sure. And right now, we've been focusing on this new required policy, and we have used the tool with that, yes. Cool. Yeah, it was really nice to get the news that our policies weren't all expiring this year. So. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, we can no take a breather. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> at a rapid pace. All right. Um, so with that, I think we should move on to the special education policy. Does Amanda, Emma, do you want to provide just a yeah, general yeah, yeah. overview of? I don't I could start. Sure, no, I was just going to talk about that. Well, I can do it. And then I'll fill in the blanks. Yeah, fill in the blanks. Okay, so the special education policy is a required policy that is going to be into effect January 15, 2021. Um, 22, 2022. And um, I've had several meetings or like back and forth with the school board association as to why the policy came into effect and why it was needed. And it was basically, what was it? <laughs> It essentially boiled down to like Vermont has not been as a state statewide Vermont has not been in compliance with special ed law, you know, sort of just in general. And so this having the schools have this policy on the books with the school board ensures that it will be folded into the policy monitoring schedule. And so we will have to take a look at how we are um, you know, meeting the, the legal requirements for special ed kids in our district on the same pace as all of our other policies. And it's basically directing uh, the districts to follow a manual that the Agency of Education is currently drafting. Uh, so this policy right now points to the special education manual that does not exist yet. Um, <laughs> so the the last we've heard was that the AOE requested an extension and they have been granted, but that hasn't come down to us. So like effectively we're supposed to follow the policy starting past the policy by January 15, but the manual is still not in place. So um, the VSBA is waiting and they will update us as soon as I will have it. In this policy at the bottom, I put cross-reference that should be taken off because that's, I does not the manual. Um, so we need to remove that. Um, so yeah, we're just waiting for the guidelines so that we can link it um, to the policy. And that's essentially what it is. It's directing us to follow the manual that the special ed department at AOE is crafting, which basically tells us how to follow the rules. And then we are supposed to then monitor that policy to ensure that we are following the special ed. And the only, this, this language is exactly how the agency, or sorry, the um, Vermont Schools Boards Association drafted their, um, what are they called? Uh, model, model policies. policies. Yeah. Model policies. Um, so we didn't change anything except for plugging in our name and then Amanda made the change at the bottom. So we wanna, we, you know, the, the equity tool um, didn't apply to like, a lot of this, but the uh, the main thing that sort of bubbled up using the equity tool was like wanting to make sure that the language of this policy was as accessible as it possibly could be 
to parents and caregivers with students in the special ed system in our district. And that when they go to read this, they're not just confused, which I think it is a little confusing when you first read it. So, so why do we have this? Um, so the only thing that we talked about as a, as a committee was adding a link to the manual so that that was like very easy to access and go straight from the policy to the manual. And then potentially adding a sentence or two at the top to give context around the reason why we're adopting it as a district is to ensure that it is monitored annually with the rest of our policies. So we've talked to Pietro about doing that. He's hesitant to add language to required policies. Um, so, but he said we could send him the draft of, of our proposed language and he'll let us know what he thinks after he reads that. So you may see those two additions at the next meeting. I think that's put something there. We don't know what the manual is going to be, but we're going to follow it. I don't know, it just feels weird. It's the, the, manual <laughs> the manual said by statute, so like. Yeah. No, I understand that, but it's just. So yeah, yeah we don't know. Know. Right. Yeah, exactly. I think what they're hoping is that by the time we get to our third reading, <laughs> it'll be ready. <laughs> so we may end up having to hold up. You know, we talked about that at the committee of, does it make sense to actually pass a policy referring to something that doesn't exist? So I think we're, we're gonna cross that bridge when we come to it. If it doesn't exist yet by January 15th, we have put, um, we've been trying to, did we put this on tomorrow night's meeting agenda? It, it is not more than there. I don't think. No, it's just a build contract. Tomorrow. Yeah, it, the, second, the second reading of this is on the January 5th. Okay. And then the last one is the 15th. No, the 19th. No. So oh. it's going so okay. Oh, I think Sorry. Jim must have I think Jim must have decided gone solo and made a decision not to put it on tomorrow, which okay. you know we were trying to well, sort of no, like no no because we said we could add it as, as well. like we can add it after the fact to the beginning and the okay. tomorrow. I'll ask Jim why he didn't. The plan at the at the policy committee was to put it on tomorrow night's agenda for a second reading so that we could potentially be in compliance by just by January. So I'll ask Jim why you didn't do that. We also all we also all felt that it was probably okay for us to not be in compliance by four days. Yeah. So I, I can guarantee you that's okay. So <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah. Let's yeah. yeah. I think it's good to keep it the fit. Yeah, and tomorrow we're pretty busy, and I don't think we have time to add that language in for a second meeting. So that's what we'll do. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Mia? You you mostly answered my questions. The the I I especially that Pietro is uh, hesitant to add language to a required policy, but I would just, uh, you know, agree with you that I think it could use a little bit more context. Yeah. The things that stood out to me, and I understand, you know, we need to be in compliance with the law, but I also wondered if, especially for that accessibility to parents who have, or anyone, anyone in our district, yeah. just some kind of like, this actually is why we have the manual and the policy in the first place is that we expect our, of ourselves that we provide the kind of support that every single student needs regardless of what their needs are so something that is more even more than just we have a policy so that we're in compliance with the law yes. but like something that shows that the district is really behind their kids yeah we talked about exactly that sort of like the vision and you know yeah. content and context and intent and and not just on this policy for every policy we're talking about some of our policies have that yeah yeah. Um, at the top of the policy, yeah. and then some of our policies don't. Right. And so then the question is how sort of um, involved with our vision for as a district and related as it relates to this policy can we get right in accordance with Pietro's advice? Right. So, but and this might be one where he goes, heck no. But right. and the other thing that felt like a gap to me was that it doesn't really name accountability in here. I mean, it says we have to follow the <laughs> to yeah. follow the law, but just between like the superintendent is responsible for X and the board is responsible for Y, it feels like that could actually be very helpful. Again, for people in the district who are sort of like, we've had a number of families come I and mean, people talk to Libby about this, but they, people have also come to the board and say, you must do something about literacy or special education. And it would be helpful for all of us, I think, to be on the same page about what is it that the board can actually do about special education? And what is it that is the administration's responsibility to, you know, so, so we had quite a conversation. What, yeah, I think what's hard is that we haven't seen this manual. Right. So I, I, yeah. The manual is supposed to have that. Yeah. Not, not necessarily like that. 
whether the board or the administration, but so the um, data like and the, accountability, like what you have to do. So it's like, okay, yeah. so we have to wait for it. Yeah. We have to wait for that to be able to. But that was point. on our radar right. and it was a, a big part of our, con like exactly what you just said was a big part of our conversation when using the equity tool was like, where are these measures and how, okay. do, we, how do we address it? And then we're sort of making the, the leap of faith that it most likely will be in this uh, Vermont Special Education Procedures and Practices That's Manual. Right. And we're hopeful that it will be, but we will find out. And if it's not, we can always go back and revise our own policy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. After the 15th yep. or 19th. That's or what 19th. I was just about to add. <laughs> or, <Yeah. February. laughs> or March. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Any oh. other questions on that? No. I move to adjourn. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any naysayers? <laughs> Not Anakin. <laughs> <laughs> 759. Wow. It's a quickie. <laughs>